Thank you, Jack. Uh, um, thanks to Jack and thanks to Shelley and the, uh, the entire Expo staff for putting this together. Um, Jack looks like every Italian uncle that I've ever met, by the way. I don't know if it's kind of weird for me. But uh, uh, hi, everybody. How are you? Welcome. Uh, I'm an architect. Uh, I have smooth hands. I'm not a contractor. I, uh, uh, I design green buildings. And all of the buildings that we work on are green. And to me, geothermal is the essential part of that argument because you have the better value proposition. You're offering the better product. From my perspective, my clients love geothermal because it's more comfortable, because it's more efficient, and because it's basically maintenance free. And you already know all this, but you're, you're still not realizing that you're, you're the good guys. And I want you, if you get nothing else out of today, just to remember that you, you're, you don't have to plead and ask, is it okay if we do this? You don't need to, you have the better value proposition. I do all this other stuff that is in architecture, by the way, I, uh, I speak, obviously, and I write books, and I teach, and I go all over the country, because I realize something, that my job, and ultimately your job, is to make every building a green building. Every building should have geothermal on it. That's the mindset you need to have, because that's basically the truth. For the last 30 years, we environmentalists, um, we've kind of been going about things the wrong way, right? Someone had this dumb idea 30 years ago that we were going to get everybody, you know, to agree. And that was stupid. I'm sorry, I want to apologize for behalf of the environment. That was dumb. You want everybody to agree. We can't every, every, get everybody to agree on American Idol. Like, you think you're going to get them to agree on green building? It's nuts. It's not going to happen. So my mindset now, really, for the last few years, has been just, ooh, force it on them. Just shove it down their throats and force it on them. And it's so much easier, so much better. I sleep better at night. <laughs> I feel better. You should try it. It's really much better. Because be, a green building is a better building. A green building generates its own energy, cleans its own water, sticks its roots deep into the ground, and produces heat. It's just a better building. What are you apologizing for? Just force it on. Much better, trust me. I want to uh, start with uh, one of my favorite poets, W.H. Um, Auden. And he's got this great poem. And in it, he says that we are all here on Earth to help others. What the others are here for, I have no idea. And that's, that's kind of what it's like to be an environmentalist nowadays, because all of you, I don't know if you realize, all of you are literally helping to save the world. You're all offering a super highly energy efficient product that could really help us out with our problems. And yet, like me, you probably have your mother calling you once a week saying, are you still doing that environmental thing? Like, they don't get it. Nobody gets it. And that's kind of the problem. So, uh, you know, it's tough to be an environmentalist. I get it. This is, uh, this is my daughter. She's five. Don't make any noises. It's uh, annoying. But uh, she's cute. Uh, but I took her to this project that we did and it was a net zero project. And this particular project had the solar on the ground because it was just weird that way. But the roof was small. So we had all the solar on the ground where you could see it and touch it. And she's climbing all over it. And she said, Daddy, what are these? I said, oh, honey, those are solar panels. She said, Daddy, what do they do? What do they do? And I said, oh, honey, they make clean electricity for free. And with the innocence of a child, she said, why don't all buildings have these, Daddy? Why? And I leaned down and I looked into her cute little face. And I said, because, honey, most people are douchebags. <laughs> what else am I going to say to her? I don't, I don't know. You got to talk straight with her. Why, why don't all buildings have I don't know, because people are morons. That's why. I can't explain it. So because of that, I refer to us as a species as dodo sapiens. That's the word that I now use to describe what we've evolved to. Really, dodo, we went from homo sapien to dodo sapien. Because we just, we do these dumb things. They're just really silly, like we just have like this redundancy in our environment that just <laughs> bothers people, and we end up pointing out the obvious a lot of the time, which just makes people mad, you know, and just frustrating. And uh, we just don't pay attention, we don't look at what's going on in our environment, we're not aware of our surroundings. And as a result, we forget that design is connections <laughs> and implications between things. And we just end up destroying the very thing we're trying to protect, it's just dumb, we're just stupid. Uh, and and it's not like they work. I mean, they never, I mean, you know, nobody pays attention to them anyway. So we're just dumb. We forget, like, if you're going to have a stream of hot liquid, so maybe you don't want electricity near there. Like, maybe that would be a bad idea. So we just, as a, we just forgotten how to make connections between, between things. Most of you are engineers, right? You have an engineering mindset. You, that's what your job is. Your job is making connections. And that's what I think we need to do. We need to make connections. Like, the other day, I was driving down the freeway, and I saw this bumper sticker. And, you know, it's cute. It's not my type of humor. I'm much more highbrow than this. But it's, uh, um, you know, whatever. You probably like it. Um, but I saw this bumper sticker, and then the very next bump, the very next car answered the question for me. It was really quite remarkable. 
You gotta make connections between things. That's the way it works. Because we're just on this path towards inevitable destruction. Like we can already see where this is headed. And we're just, as a result, just getting fatter and dumber and slower. You're just getting <laughs> worse. So we need to just stop being Dota sapiens. Like that's the word I use to describe because we're just, our way of life is killing us. That's basically what I've gotten to, like just that idea. So just to give you, just put things in a sense of perspective and make you realize the context that you're in, the wonderful work that you're doing, I just want to give you a very quick, albeit depressing, snapshot of where we are as a species, right? 36% of all species are threatened now with extinction. I guess you can count humans as part of that. And uh, uh, the majority of our ecosystems, every major ecosystem is in a state of decline, all dating back to the Industrial Revolution. It's all because of us, basically. We have Arctic sea ice at its lowest volume on record, and we measure this, you know, with uh, data, right? And as a direct result of that, sea level just keeps rising, some 200 millimeters, and just keeps going. And all of that's just, we, it's now on a roll. We just, we almost can't stop it. And our population, like if that weren't enough, our population is bursting at the seams, right? Push, it just crossed seven billion last year, headed towards nine billion. And in my lifetime, I mean, I'm not that, I'm not as old as Jack, but in my lifetime, the Earth's population has doubled. And in my daughter's lifetime, it's gonna double again. So it's just going to get more and more constrained. It's just going to get, you know, more congested in here. So we're sc screwed, really, for lack of a better word. I don't know how else to say it. Look at your faces. I'm so sorry. Hopefully I'm not the first person to tell you this. We're screwed. All I have for you is bad news, by the way. It's just all bad news. You better buckle up. It's just going to be this all downhill for the next hour. You have to understand something. Nobody even invites me to dinner anymore. I'm like Debbie Downer. Like, nobody wants to hear from me. Because I just, if I weren't here, I'd just be sitting in the hotel room, you know, rocking in the fetal position. That's basically what I'd be doing because it's just all depressing, and it's just going to get worse. It's just going to be this, and pfft, just a whole lot worse. This is, a, this is an ad from 1961. This is a real ad. This is from Life magazine, and this is for the non-ironically named Humble Energy. And look at the tagline. Every day, they supply enough energy to melt 7 million tons of glacier. And they couldn't have possibly known then what we know now which is, that's exactly what we did. That's, that was our entire plan, all from the start. That's what we've done. So as a result, we just need to stop being total sapiens. We just need to stop this silliness. We know better now. You know, we can pay attention and do it. So we are a nation of addicts, right? You've got uh, uh, 71 million Americans addicted to tobacco, 74 million Americans addicted to food. I mean, you've got 6% of the population addicted to pot. Some of them people probably you know, if you know what I mean. But... Uh, but we have one addiction that's affecting all of us, 100% of us, and that addiction is oil, fossil fuels. And we are addicted to it. Our presidents go on, the, on television and tell us we're addicted to it. So we need to do something about it. And uh, come on, slip up. There we go. My father smoked for uh, 65 years, and he just quit just recently, which is kind of dumb. But he just quit now at 77. And, uh, and my whole life growing up, my dad would always say, when cigarettes are a dollar a pack, I'm going to quit. When they're $2 a pack, I'm going to quit. He never quit, he just because he's addicted. He was a pathetic. We would tease him about it, right? And now I hear people making that same argument about oil. When it's $3 a gallon, I'm going to quit. When it's $4 a gallon, I'm going to quit. Go ahead. I dare you. I dare you. To, you can't quit. None of us can quit. We've designed everything around cheap oil, and now it's not cheap anymore, and we're stuck. This is not Photoshop, by the way. This is the joy of living in California. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, this is. So give me a number. How high does it need to get? $6, $8, $9 a gallon? Because it will get there. You need to remember, oil is a commodity. And historically, every commodity just gets more and more expensive, just gets harder and harder to get. Yet solar, wind, geothermal, those are technologies. And like any technology, they just keep going down in price. Think how big and clunky and expensive your first cell phone was. And now they give them away. That's what's going to happen. All technologies keep going down in price. Solar keeps going up. And it's not like we're going to make more oil. I mean, where are you going to get it from? Jurassic Park, where you get, it's a fossil fuel. Some of you won't get this joke, that's cool. It's fine, just turn to your neighbor. It's a fossil fuel, you can't make more of it. <laughs> They'll explain it later. So that's what, happened, that's what happened in this country. Really, our oil production peaked in 1970, and it's been a steady decline ever since, and that's why we've been importing it every year since then. And it's just gonna get harder and harder to get. So we need to make a decision, we need to make a choice. Do we stay on this path that we already see where it's headed, the outcome is inevitable, or do we switch to something else? And I think it's pretty clear what we do. As cheap energy, slaves were unbeatable until a less troublesome energy source was discovered and a new era began. Human numbers increased five times over and with each person wanting more and more stuff, 
oil became the resource worth fighting for all around the world. So that's what I mean when I say we're Dodo sapiens, because you got, you know, through the evolutionary process, you got Homo sapien, and then boom, Dodo sapien right after that. And we have this wonderful rich history, this wonderful history of art and poetry and music and culture, and at one point we just sat down and pfft, we just kind of like lost our way. We just kind of, ugh. It's kind of gross. And we're not improving. We're not, we're not really getting, <laughs> we're not really getting any better. It's kind of like this. The process which had once favored the noblest traits of man now began to favor different traits. Most science fiction of the day predicted a future that was more civilized and more intelligent. But as time went on, things seemed to be heading in the opposite direction. So I'm a bit, I'm like a, a cultural anthropologist, right? I sit in cafes and I study you people. I make notes of your behavior because it's weird to me, man. The things that we do in the name of progress are just strange to knowingly just toxify everything. It's kind of gross. You realize we just, we, talk, we ruined everything. We toxified the entire planet, just destroyed everything. And we didn't even have any fun doing it. You know what I mean? Like, if you're going to have a party, at least enjoy it while you're at it. And we just haven't, because the warning signs are coming louder and louder, closer and closer together. And we just can't ignore them anymore. So that's what I mean by, like, why, why are you asking permission to do the right thing? Why are you saying to your clients, please, would you consider geothermal? Just force it on them. So much easier. Because knowing what we know, why would we give them an inefficient system? Why would we knowingly put formaldehyde in a, in a project? Why would we knowingly use high VOC paints? Knowing what we know, it's just silly, it doesn't work. So there's no, so I just force it on them, really, it's much better. And especially knowing now what our resources are and we tax it to the limit, we just can't afford to keep that mindset, that kind of cavalier mindset that we just you know, keep consuming, it doesn't work. Because when oil was cheap, I get it, it made total sense, let's make everything out of oil. When it was just bubbling out of the ground everywhere in Oklahoma and Texas, total sense. But now we make the entire building out of oil. And it's not cheap anymore. And we can find other ways, better ways to do it, and do it domestically. And all the, the, the process of putting all these toxic materials into these buildings is just making us sicker and sicker. And our kids, the, unfortunately, their immune systems aren't as tough, so they suffer more than anybody. And now one in 88 kids now has autism, and among males, it's one in 54. It's higher for some reason. They don't know why. One in 20 kids has seizures, and they're not even quite sure why that's happening. And one in 12 has food allergies. Now, when I was a kid, nobody had food allergies. I mean, there was one kid that if he drank milk, he'd fart, and we'd beat him up. But otherwise, nobody had food allergies. <laughs> And now, like, every kid has, at my daughter's school, like, every kid has a little bracelet and has food allergies. I went to pick her up the other day, and I forgot that I had a peanut granola bar in my pocket. And they tackled me to the ground like I'm a criminal. It was unbelievable. So it's just, it's just getting worse and worse. One in ten kids has ADHD. One in nine has asthma, which is directly linked to the indoor air quality and the environment, which you affect, by the way. And one in six are learning disabled. And plus, we feed them crap all the time, so one in three are overweight. And if you add up all these factors together, essentially half our kids or either sick or fat. That's basically what we've taken, that's what we've done. Thank you for laughing at that, you <laughs> sicko. It's always one person that like giggles at that. I don't blame you, I would do the same thing. Uh, but imagine a building built like a tree. Imagine a building built the way nature does. Look at what nature does effortlessly. Sinks its roots into the ground, becomes a water pump, fixes nitrogen, filters the soil, filters water, absorbs carbon, and produces oxygen. Just imagine what we could do if we followed nature's model to do that. And our buildings now are just scratching the surface of what's possible. It's almost laughable what we're doing. Slap a few green roofs on, right? Every building should have geothermal because we want to build the way nature builds. That's what happens. We want to build like a tree. That's our goal. That's your goal. That's what you're doing. You're sticking these beautiful roots in the ground and you're pulling up warmth from the warmth of the sun. Why wouldn't you? I mean, why wouldn't every building do this? It's a wasted opportunity if they don't. That's the mindset you need to have. Just force it on. So I want to take you on a time warp. I want to take you back to uh, a simpler time, a happier time, a time when everybody had terrible haircuts and awful clothing. And I call this time, quite frankly, 1972. Most of you, old, you, most of you remember it. I can see the gray hair. Most of you remember 1972. And it was a weird time to be alive, 1972. It was a crazy time to be alive back then. I don't know if you, maybe you blocked it out, but it was an awful, awful time to be alive back then. If someone called you, you would be at home. Do you remember that, how awful it was? And the phone was usually in one room, the kitchen. I don't know why. And they had just that long cord. And if someone had a nine or a zero in their number, 
you hated them for it, right? You're like, mm, I don't want that guy that much. He's not worth it. This is, you had to get up to change the channel. That's how bad it was in 1972. You see what I'm saying to you? This is what wristwatches looked like back then. This is how bad it was. This was their Batman back then. You see what I'm saying? It was an awful, awful time to be alive. And books came on paper, whatever that is, and uh, don't even get me started on video games. I played that for hours. Hours. This was the best-selling car of the year that year. A car that blew up if you sneeze too loud, by the way. And uh, don't even get me started on the music or the haircut. It was a terrible, terrible time to be alive. They could only use their spaceships once back then. Isn't that weird? And computers filled entire rooms. And the internet, by the way, only appeared on 25 of them. That's how bad it was back then. Which explained why porn back then looked like this. It was an awful, awful time to be alive. Every major technology has just advanced so much since 1972. Every major technology has just improved just immensely since 1972. Every major technology, except our buildings. Do you realize we now have three-dimensional printers capable of producing geometries we never even conceived of before? But our buildings still look like this. We have electric vehicles capable of running hundreds of miles on a single charge, but our buildings still look like this. We have three-dimensional three digitizers capable of capturing a room in real time and allowing you to manipulate it instantly. But our buildings still look like this. We have solar tracking devices that track the sun throughout the course of the day, converting them to light, heat, and energy. But our buildings still look like this. We even have a little device you put in your pocket that tells you when the hot donuts are ready. That's impressive. But the donut shop? still looks like this. Every major technology is advanced except our buildings. And the trouble is us. This is our fault. You got engineers who are way too linear, right? So they're kind of useless. You got architects that are too like, shy to actually speak up and give us a bold vision of what needs to be done. So they're kind of useless. You got contractors who build exactly what you tell them to. <laughs> really? Really? For those of you not laughing, there's no door. See, there's no door. <laughs> In case you like wonder why are they laughing? There's no door. And don't even get me started on the building inspectors. Uh, so we did a, a gray water system. We recycle water, right? And we take soapy water and we flush the toilets with it. It's a great idea. It saves thousands of gallons of water. It's amazing. And the building inspector said, "Oh, you gotta, um, you gotta put, gotta put up a sign." Who, who's, who, who's that for? And with a straight face, he looks at me without blinking. He goes, oh, well, you know, uh, uh, sometimes dogs drink out of the toilet. And I said, uh, my dog can't read. Useless, <laughs> utterly useless. But buildings are what need to change. Buildings are what must change because buildings are responsible for the whole mess. Half of our carbon emissions come from our buildings. 40% of all the world's energy materials go into our buildings. Einstein famously said, we shall require a substantially new manner of thinking if mankind is to survive. So we need to change. We need to really change what we're doing. And the trouble, as I see it, is that we've lost an essential part of our humanity. And that part is what I call shame. We don't have shame. Like, you've seen reality TV. There's no shame anymore. But my dog, his brain is this big, and my dog is smart enough to feel shame. Like, this dog, this dog can feel shame, but human beings can't. And that's what we need to inject a little bit, I think, in our society. I'll give you an example. This is the old executive office building. This is in Washington, D.C. This is now the vice president's office, by the way. And at the time it was built, Mark Twain called it the ugliest building in America. And now it's gorgeous, right? Just by today's standards, it's considered gorgeous. But back then, it was considered gaudy and like hottish, and, you know, and it was a monstrosity. And it was designed by this man, Alfred Mullet. Uh, you all know Alfred from his haircuts, right? You all know Alfred. <laughs> and Mr. Mullet was so embarrassed by the, by the criticism that he received from his building that he killed himself. And there's a few architects I wish would follow his example, if you know what I mean. Not all, just a few. Just not everybody, just a few. Because we, can, because we can't be building inefficient, ugly buildings anymore. We know better. We know too much to keep doing it. We need to bring a little shame back into it. Because there, we can do better than this. This is an awful, this is in San Francisco. It's a terrible, ugly building. We can do a lot better than this. We should be doing better than this. Every building should be a green building. There's really only seven ways to motivate human beings to do anything. And you know what they are instinctively, right? There's fear, impulse, jealousy, and shame. And then the last three are passion, pride, and profit. And since the first few were negative, let's focus on those last three, passion, pride, and profit. Let's put passion into green geothermal. 
Let's put passion into work because we're offering the better value proposition. Let's take pride in what we're doing because we're actually helping to save the planet. And then if you do those two things, you're going to profit, I guarantee you. That's the way it works. I was talking to a friend of mine, a landscape architect, and he said, don't you realize that we are change agents? We change things. People don't like their surroundings and they call us and they change them because we transform ugly things like this into beautiful things. That's what we do. We make things better. We're change agents. And that's what we need to do with geothermal. We need to make people realize that the older heating systems aren't good enough. Blowing hot air on me from energy, from out, that's stupid. Don't do that. That's terrible. We need to make them realize they need a change. We need to make them lust after. We need to make them desire. That's what we need to do because we're on this path towards inevitable destruction. And we've been building buildings the same way for 200 years. So we need to change. We need to revolt. We're headed off a cliff, quite frankly. And if you're headed off a cliff, slowing down doesn't help. And doing it a Prius doesn't help really either. <laughs> I mean, you'll look good doing it, but it's not gonna, it's not, it doesn't change the outcome, if you know what I mean. We gotta turn the wheel, we gotta go in a different direction. Frankly, we need to just go a different way. We need to revolt, we need a revolution. We need to transform how we build our buildings. That's what's needed, and we need to do it today. We can't, we can't afford to wait anymore. Because as I said, the warning signs are coming louder and louder, closer and closer together. And this is not designed to be subtle. I mean, they don't pick red to be subtle. This is, I mean, I don't know how much more they could, in your face, tell you, hey, dum dum, look over here. This is important. That's the way, that's what's happening now. So that's why I go all over the country. I don't even argue with people about climate change anymore. I used to. I used to love it. I used to just argue with them till they cry. That's, that was my hobby. I don't do it anymore. It's not worth my time. There's no point in it really anymore because the cost of inaction is too expensive. We are, and we know this. We've just known this because we can see what's headed for us. In the 1970s, we hit peak oil in this country. We hit a point where basically it would just get harder and harder to pull oil out of the ground. That's why we started importing it. And now we've hit what I like to think of as peak nature. We've hit a point where our resources are taxed so thin that we just, it's just going to get harder and harder, more and more convenient. That's basically what's happening. Every decade, every generation has their industry, right? In the 1930s, it was oil. In the 40s, it was steel. In the 50s, it was plastics. In the 60s, it was chemicals. And you all saw the graduates, you know what I'm talking about, right? And then in the 70s and 80s, it was computers. In the 90s, it was banking, and you know how well that turned out. And in the last decade, it's really lost to, you know, security. But the next few decades need to be about living buildings, regenerative buildings, buildings built like a tree. That's the next big thing. That's what we need to focus on. That's our opportunity. It's our chance to not only save ourselves, but actually make a lot of money in the process and redesign the world. So I don't argue with these people anymore. There's no point. It's not worth it. We can't afford to wait anymore, basically. So there's several types of dodo sapiens that I want to talk about today. I'm not going to go through all these, but I'm just going to, I handpicked a few for you that I thought would be relevant. The first type is the skeptic, the skeptical dodo sapien. And I meet these guys all the time, right? I'm at a conference and afterwards they come up and they, they always have like a smirk on their face. Like I, I know when they're coming, like I see them from across the room, like, oh boy, here he comes. And, uh, and they always have some tidbit of information, but they all follow basically the same pattern. And one of the things they like to mention is that the scientific consensus is still out. Let me show you what out means. Of 14,000 peer-reviewed articles, a whopping 24 were rejected for some scientific thing or another. The rest were accepted as fact. That's as much consensus as you're going to see. So this is, this is when they say the scientific consensus is out, this is, this is consensus. It doesn't get any better than this. And there are these arguments they use over and over again. And I want to tell you about them so you can be prepared. The first one is the ad hominem argument. This is where they attack you instead of actually the point you're trying to make. So for instance, this is where they go, well, you, you don't, you're not an environmentalist. You, you, know, you drive a car or you wear shoes, or you live indoors, or whatever it is they're arguing, right? They're like attacking the wrong thing. That's not the point. Don't get distracted by it. Stay focused on message. The second is the loaded question argument. And in comedy, the famous loaded question is, hey, how long have you been uh, you know, beating your wife? Like, that's the famous loaded question. And environmentalism, it's the same thing. People, people have said this to me. How long have you, been, have you been a communist? People say that with a straight face. They ask me that question, to which I reply all my life. That's basically, that pisses them off even more. The next is the all or nothing argument. This is where they say, well, you know, because you support gay marriage, you think that only gay people can get married. No, I think gay people have the right to be as miserable as everybody else. If they want to get married, it's just go be. All the married people are laughing. Look at that, it's funny. And then my favorite is the guilt by association argument. This is where they say, you know that uh, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber? He believed in climate change. And if you don't believe me, they posted billboards of it in Texas and hung them out everywhere for people to see. This is a real thing. They, like, that's going to convince people. And the ultimate last one, the ultimate best one, is the false cause argument. And people have said this to me. A few people have said this to me. You know, we never had climate change before women got the vote. <laughs> yeah, it's the women. And they're 
uteruses. I don't know, I don't quite know what they're doing. Carbon's coming out of them some way and it's causing the problem. Yeah, it's not. By the way, it's not. Don't think that. Uh, the trouble is that we have this just misinformation system all the time, 24 hours running, that's just constantly just spewing and confusing people. And it kind of works like this. Some, some people say that'd be a pretty good choice. Bring in the Hispanic crowd. Some people say, ah, he's posturing. Some indeed. people say, and excuse me, I'll get to you, Joe, in just a second, but some people say that you may be setting up Sharpton for a run against Hillary in 2006 in the Senate. Journalistically, it's a very peculiar technique because the idea behind journalism is that you're sourcing who you're referring to. This is just sort of a clever way of, of inserting political opinion when you know it probably shouldn't be there. Some people say that this might undermine what the U.S. troops are doing there. Some people say some people say John Kerry has some similarities to an earlier Massachusetts politician. And some people say in light of what's happened with the oil for food program, some people say supported by Iran. Some say I've heard a couple people say it goes on for 20 minutes. I can't take it anymore. So uh, you get the idea. I found, this, um, I found this German word. I'd never seen this word before. And you know how much fun German people are, right? I found this German word, Weltschmerz. And I'd never heard this word before. And this word loosely translates to, it's just the depression you feel when the world doesn't live up to your expectations. And we all kind of suffer from Weltschmerz a little bit because the world, this shouldn't be a normal, pro this shouldn't be business as usual. This is where we just toxify everything. That doesn't make sense. So I think we're all just a little saddened by it, really. And it just made me realize that we're just, the worst mammals ever. Because I don't know if you realize that everything you've ever used, everything you've ever bought, is here. It's still here. Like, we don't put it into space. It's here. It's somewhere on the planet. It's here. Like, remember in the 90s when you're in your nirvana and you bought that flannel shirt and you like wore it for six months and you forgot about it and put it in a closet? Well, that's here. It's somewhere. It's not your closet anymore. It's probably New Jersey. That's probably where it is. But it's, it's, it's still here. <laughs> like, we didn't send it in a space shuttle. It's here somewhere. And remember when you were going to get into shape and you bought those rollerblades and you did it for like a week and you gave up? The roller, their rollerblades are still here. They're somewhere. I don't know. They're probably in the ocean somewhere. I don't know where they are. And now, you know, tonight you're going to go out on the town maybe and order some sushi and you're going to, what's this? And it's little bits of rollerblade and you're wondering how that get there because of us. We put it there because everything is still here. So we're just terrible, terrible mammals. We're just terrible creatures. And it doesn't help that we brag about our dominion over the planet. I mean, we're sore winners. That's what we are. I don't know if you realize that. We're just awful winners. And we're just by design, we're just, ugh, we're just terrible creatures. Because first of all, we get tired easily. We cry at the drop of a hat. That's kind of weird. We're easily trippable. You never see a zebra trip, do you? It's just only humans that do it. And we just die in just the dumbest ways possible. We're just awful, just terrible creatures by design. And this is why your cat just looks at you the way it does. Like, ugh, just ugh, fed up with us. Because it's like, why are you like that? That should have gotten a bigger laugh, by the way. I don't know why I did <laughs> So just by design, we're just icky creatures. And we're not improving. We're not getting better. Like, for example, this was, this is 1903. This was the world's largest man. And this was just some cop in Newark. Do you see what I'm saying to you? <laughs> like, we're not improving. We're not learning. We're not getting better. And yet, when I try to do something good, something like, hey, let's do geothermal. Let's do solar. People, all I did is wave after wave of excuse why we can't do that. You can't put solar on the roof. Um, the panels will catch fire. Well, you know they're made of glass and steel, right? Like, they don't really... You can't put solar on the roof. Uh, uh, someone will steal them. Well, you know, we bolt them down. They're not, like heavy. Like they're not going to just blow it. Like that, just all these stupid excuses. And as a result, there's just this pattern, right? That if you want to disrupt the industry, and that's what you are, you're all disruptors, there's going to be this resistance because you're, you're messing with other financial interests. And then they're going to lobby against it. And they're going to try to put laws in place to prevent you from doing it. And then there's going to be some sort of tragedy. Deepwater Horizon, Fukushima, whatever it is. And then there's going to be some cleanup. And the cleanup gets botched. And then there's the outrage. And then all these new regulations get put into place, but nobody ever enforces in it. And then the cycle just starts again and again. And as a result, we just have this history of environmental disasters. And if you look at the top 20 environmental disasters, they've all occurred in the last generation. So we're not improving. We're not getting better. And if you apply these to a map and start to see the areas affected, you can see we're running out of places to live. I mean, unless we're all going to live in Australia, which is nice, but still, we're, we're, there's nowhere else for us to live that's not toxified. So one of the things that I like to do is I like to look at regulation. I, as a, a fun thing, I like to look at it. And uh, like this is the Clean Air Act. This was the premier piece of environmental legislation ever. There's multiple parts to it. And every single part, the coal industry fought it, right? With benzene or sulfur dioxide. They said, you can't make us do that. That'll cost $1,500 a ton. That's too expensive. We can't afford it. And the EPA said, well, actually, we did some numbers, and we think it'll be half that amount. And the actual cost was under $100 a ton because everybody had to do it. Same thing with benzene. You can't make us retrofit our plants. That'll cost over a quarter of a million dollars. 
It's un-American, they said at the time. And the EPA said, actually, we think it'll be less than half that, and the actual cost was zero. Because everybody had to do it. So they stopped making the equipment that used benzene. That's just the way it works. That's what regulation does. It pr promotes innovation by creating a level playing field. That's the opportunity for you as geothermal installers, because your technology is going to keep getting better and better and cheaper and cheaper. Come on. There we go. So if you add up the actual cost of regulation, the actual cost, it's usually less than 1%. So all that fuss is over a little bit of, I mean, you know, a little bit of fuss. A little bit of it is 3%. Virtually none of it is above the 4 or 5% range. So basically what they're spending on donuts is what they're complaining about. Which brings me to our next type of dota sapien, the bureaucrat dota sapien. And the bureaucrat dota sapien is an interesting cat because they love paperwork. But they forget that the bigger issue is to actually just make us safer. So for instance, this is uh, anarchy, marked here by the, you know, the lack of regulation is anarchy, marked here by the circle A. And of course the ultimate symbol convenience marked here by the circle K. And the two are kind of polar opposites. But just think about it. If Noah wanted to build his ark today, I don't think he could. I mean, he couldn't. First, they'd tell him, well, you need a building permit, obviously, because you're building something. Then he would need a sprinkler system, because it's a wood frame building. He, the HOA would be on his butt, because he's building this in his front yard, so they'd probably find him every day. He'd need a height variance, because the ark's too tall. The SBCA would come down on him, because all the animals there, and make sure that they're not doing weird things. And then um, he'd be cited for, ironically, building in a floodplain. It would never get built. It would take like forever to do, and it just never happened. And that's kind of the problem. And then the INS would come down and make sure all his workers are documented and everything. It just would become just such a pain in the ass that nothing would change. And that's kind of the problem. But other countries are now leapfrogging us. This is the Burj Khalifa. This is now the tallest building in the world. This was in Mission Impossible 4 or 5 or whatever that movie was. And uh, uh, it's uh, over half a mile high, and they did it in six years. That's the amazing part. They did this in six years. And um, it's two World Trade Centers t stacked tip to tip, if you were to build it. Yet our own World Trade Centers were like, we're, it's still, they're still not done. It's been 12 years and counting. We used to be the innovators. We used to be the ones that led the country. We used to be the ones that just would impress the world with our abilities. And we're now facing the worst recession we've seen in 80 years in a time when we should be innovating, when we sh should be pushing geothermal technologies. We're not. We're desperately clinging to the old technologies. And as a result, we're not getting the, the buoyancy that we should be getting. Yet these green collar jobs, or gold collar jobs as Jack called them, are the future. And by 2035, they're going to represent some 20 million Americans. You are the future, whether you realize it or not. You're the good guys. Which brings me to my next type of dodo sapien, the consumer dodo sapien. And the consumer dodo sapien doesn't remember all of this stuff, doesn't realize all the stuff going on around them, but regulations have helped them along the way. So for instance, I remember going to school and the school closing because they had to clean out all the asbestos. And it was awesome. It was great. Three weeks you know, without school. But that's how old I am, right? They used to close it for asbestos. And my parents picked me up in a car with no catalytic converter, no seatbelts, and filled with cigarette smoke. And they took me in this death trap to the dentist who gave me mercury fillings. Do you see what I'm saying to you? Today, that's child abuse. It's all child abuse, basically, today. But back then, that was normal. That's just the way we did things. That's what regulations have done. They've improved all of that. And that's what we need to remember, which brings us to my next type of dota sapien, the policymaker dota sapien. Now, I live in California, and we have some doozies there. This is uh, Dana Rohrbacher. This is the genius that got up on television and said, hey, I've got a solution for climate change. Let's cut down all the trees. That's it. That was his whole plan, by the way. Please don't do that. Don't cut down all the trees. That would be awful. That would be catastrophic. But he said this out loud, and he actually believes this. And this guy he is in Congress. That's kind of a problem. Then we have other politicians. This is John Huntsman. He's the one that famously said during the presidential election, he said, just to be clear, I believe in science. I believe in climate change. And this single-handedly ended his presidential aspirations. I mean, this in his complete lack of charisma. But still, you get the idea, right? So I work with these scientists all the time, or these, these politicians all the time. And it kind of works like this. As president of Planet Spaceball, I can assure both you and your viewers that there's absolutely no air shortage whatsoever. Yes, of course. I've heard the same rumor myself. Yes, thanks for calling and not reversing the charges. Yes, bye. So that's what it's like dealing with politicians. Like, you never know, quite know what to believe because they'll say one thing and then do another. And typically, they're really well versed on the issues. It's quite amazing. But the, but the public is left kind of confused all the time, not wondering what's going on. Which brings us to our next type of dota sapien, the developer dota sapien. And the developer dota sapien has been dictating what we build and how we build for decades. I don't know if you've seen this new store everywhere that's popping up called Available. Have you seen this store? I don't know what they sell there, but it's really popular. Every city I go to has these Availables everywhere. It's just, it, this must be the fastest growing chain in the country. It's got to be. 
Just cause I'm thinking about getting a franchise, frankly, because it's just everywhere you turn, just available, available. That's a stupid joke. I'm sorry. That's... I was on a panel with uh, Ed Begley Jr., uh, you know, the actor guy, and he had this great quote. And in it, he says that anytime we destroy something created by man, well, that's called vandalism. But anytime we destroy something created by nature, well, that's called progress. And that's been the paradigm of development for the last 30 years. And that's what needs to change. The two don't need to be mutually exclusive. And the trouble as I see it is really what I call short-term thinking. <laughs> Let it soak in. Let it just soak in a little bit. <laughs> short-term thinking. Short-term thinking is when you don't think about the consequences of your actions. Short-term thinking is when you don't make connections between what you're doing and the world around you. Short-term thinking is when you don't really think about your future or the implications of your health or anything else. Short-term thinking is when you start to lessen some of your career options. You know what I mean? That's short-term thinking. And we just all, we as human beings, we suffer a little bit from short-term thinking. I think we're kind of wired that way, really, for short-term thinking. Short-term thinking is when the state of Louisiana says, hey, can we have $42 million to fix the levees? And we say no, and it costs $100 billion after they fail. That's short-term thinking. And it's all, that's a byproduct of what we do. And yet, what you're doing, you're going out there and trying to convince clients of a better, better way. I, I was talking to a developer, and I said, let's put food. We'll grow food on the outside of the building. It'll be awesome. And he said... Food, what if uh, the homeless people eat it? Oh my God, feeding homeless people. Fruits and vegetables, ugh, how dare we do that? That would be awful. And I said, calm down, calm down. If that becomes, I mean, unless you start seeing this everywhere, it's not a problem, it's not really a problem. If this happens, we'll take the food down, but in the meantime, let them eat. I mean, they're, you know, they need it. And if you really are worried about money, there's other crops you could grow, I guess, if you're really that worried about it. So that's what I mean. Like, we're trying to change the world, and people are stopping us. They don't let us do it. And so that's what we need is we need long-term thinking. We need to start thinking long-term about our decisions and our actions. And part proof of that is all the crumbling infrastructure that we've been having. And this is a huge opportunity for you. The infrastructure, if anything, Hurricane Sandy showed us that our infrastructure is not strong enough. It can't resist now what's going to become regular things. And images like this haunted people. And most of our infrastructure was put in in the 50s and 60s. It only had a 50-year lifespan, so it's overdue for development. And this is why you've been hearing about infrastructure so much lately. Right? Plus, if we redo our infrastructure, it's a chance for us to do it right. And we've done this before. In World War II, we asked people to make concessions, to, to make sacrifices. In the name of victory, we told people to ration things, to conserve energy, all in the name of victory. And that's what we need to do today. Set a new course for what defines victory in the 21st century. Look at the things we asked people to do in the 1940s. Wear a sweater, can your food, grow your own food, winterize your home, seal around your windows, all in the name of victory. And the best part is we can do it again. All we need to do is just set a course to that direction to do it. That's what's needed. Come on, there we go. And if we do it right this time, we can input geothermal energy efficient systems throughout all of it and then cut our energy use by at least 30%, if not more. But the trouble is, anytime I talk to people about infrastructure, they get bored. I mean, look at your faces. You're bored out of your mind right now. You're like looking at your phone. I get it, it's boring. You, want to be, you don't want to talk about infrastructure. You want to be just happy and fun all the time. You want to be entertained. I get it. It's fun. It's boring. You don't want, you don't want to hear about infrastructure. You want it like something like um, this. You want something like this would be better for you. For the two people in the room that don't know, this is Korean rapper Psy. And he's got this uh, catchy song, you see. And as of this morning, it's been watched 1.7 billion with a B times. And uh, it's four minutes long. So I did the math for you, 1.7 billion times 4 point whatever minutes, it's 14,000 human years. 14,000 human years spent watching this. Open Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style. Op, 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 op. Open Gangnam Style. I can't do it, I can't do it anymore, sorry. I've seen it, I've seen it too much. It's cute, I get it, it's cute. Once, twice maybe, it's cute. But 14,000 human years of that? Do you, we could have jetpacks by now. Do you realize that? We'd be having jetpacks. It'd be awesome. I mean, I get to see, watch it once, but over and over again, it's, ugh, it's awful. If you want to spend four minutes watching something, at least watch something smart because entertain your, by, you know, educate your brain because we're not getting better. Or we're just getting dumber and dumber. We're getting slower. And so we're not fooling anybody, right? This is, come on, this thing's dying. Anyway, we're not fooling, nobody thinks this is grass, right? You're not fooling anybody. This is not, it's not working. 
And we just do these dumb things that just don't make, like, that don't make any... Do you realize that we, we raise money for juvenile diabetes by selling candy? Do you realize how dumb that is? Do you realize... We had Sun Chips, which are delicious, by the way. Sun Chips, they did this great thing. They made this biodegradable bag. You throw it away and it feeds the soil. Well, Americans complained. And when I open the bag, it's too noisy. It makes too much noise. I can't hear myself shove my chips in my fat face. Like, people wrote letters about this. And they changed the bag back. That's, ugh. You only get the bags in Europe now, by the way. And we're the same species that for some, re some reason needs touchable soap. Soap's too dirty for us to touch. We need touchable soap. And just put your hand under it like, God forbid, you touch the... With the same, the same country that eats pink slime in their cheeseburgers doesn't want to touch soap. That's, we that's weird to me. That's strange. We're the same country that if you want to do this, McDonald's sign 50 fine in the air, fine. Go ahead. That's beautiful. That's great. That's exciting. But I want to do this. Ugh, that's disgusting. How dare you? And people get mad and write letters. That's weird. That's weird to me. That just doesn't make any sense. This is the same country that it looks like Obama was going to win re-election. They went on Twitter and said out loud, that's socialist. I'm going to move to Canada. Let me explain something about Canada. I, I've, been to, I've been to Canada. I met the premier there, by the way. She's a uh, female, uh, gay, and socialist. That's like the socialist hat trick. I mean, their heads are going to explode. <laughs> so my advice is go. Go to Canada, please. And you'll love it up there. It's nice. Go. It doesn't make any sense. And yet we just get distracted with these things that are not news, that are not stories. Right? Real stories just get buried at the bottom. Ethan Zuckerman has this great idea. He said that we should call a Kardashian a unit of attention. So we watch the news. Well, climate change got 0 .001 Kardashians today. Like, that would be the news story. And it's not just them. I mean, if I ever see them, I'm punching them in the face. I'll tell you that right now. But it's not just them. It's just all these other dumb stories that are just not important to us that we don't need to fill our heads with. Blowhards and morons. We, we can do better than this. A lot better. And yet, I go all over the country, sometimes the world, I go all over, and whenever I say these two words, climate change, sometimes people freak out when they hear these two words. Please don't freak out. Don't leave. Sometimes they get up and they storm out, and when people leave, they cover their ears. That's weird. They don't want any knowledge going in their head as they leave. And historically, after 15 years of speaking publicly, it's always been all white men. I don't know. Women are too nice to, to leave, I guess. But it's always been all white men. And now the other day I was just daydreaming, you know, just my mind was just wandering. And I just started imagining a day when all the old white men are gone. That's, and that's awful. I shouldn't be thinking that. What a terrible feeling. Jack here's a lovely man. Don't beat him up. He's a wonderful human being. It's not his fault. <laughs> but we're just, we're just stuck in this cycle of just, ugh, like who's this? Honestly, you're, you're in a happy place. Who's drinking out of the toilet? Just admit it now because we'll help you. We'll find help for you. Just stop doing it because I'm tired of putting up signs. This is stupid. We can do a lot better. We can do a hell of a lot better. Do you realize that if your cat is too cold, it'll get up and sleep in the sun? And if cows are too warm, they'll get up and move to the shade? Like, they're smart enough to do that. But human beings, like, we don't, like, eh, I don't know what to do. Like, they're not too dumb to even put on a sweater. Like, we're just, like, useless. They're just hitting a thermostat with a rubber chicken. It's just not working. It doesn't make any sense. And yet, environmentalists just, we end up infighting and fighting with each other. You're buying the wrong type of dental floss. Somebody said that to me. Because I'm not buying vegan, gluten-free dental. I don't even know what the type they get. It's just dumb. We can do better. And so far, the only benefit I can see of all of us just getting dumber and dumber is that the racists don't know how to draw swastikas anymore. That's the only benefit. <laughs> you you got to give him credit. He tried three times. He really... <laughs> Here's my favorite part of it. On the third one, he just stopped. <laughs> so not only is he racist, but he's a quitter, too. So it's... <laughs> Yet, I don't know if you realize this, but this last summer with, you know, record heat, people paid other people to spray paint their lawns. I'm not making, this is a real thing. This, and it's not, by the way, it's not food coloring they're putting on, it's paint. They're painting their lawns with paint because you've got to have a green lawn. So we can do better than this. Do you realize we now have more vacant houses than we do homeless people by a factor of four? And for all of you engineers in the room, you know that's just a resource management problem waiting to be solved. We decided we'd rather build things like this and like this than feed the poor. So we're just, we're disconnected. We don't know what we're doing anymore. Because things like this should not happen in this country. These are things that are not supposed to happen in this country. Not in the same country anyway. And if you see this, this is no longer a resource problem. This is a human rights problem. This is an environmental justice problem. And all of you have an opportunity to fix that. Because as I said, we toxified everything. We just made everything just such a drag, just awful. But perhaps it was said best by my friend Louis. 
We ruined everything here. This was the great, it was just coast to coast, just green and brown and beautiful. And, and all the humans were just walking around with painted faces, just walking. And they'd be like, ooh, that looks yummy. And they just eat from the ground and then they'd sleep on the grass and then they'd go for a swim and do a little dance. That was the whole continent was just folks doing that. Now, if you show a five or six or seven year old these logos, they'll be, surprisingly, they'll be able to identify pretty much all of them. It's kind of freaky, actually. But they wouldn't be able to identify these leaves. So there's this disconnect. There's, we're teaching the wrong things. Which, by the way, you can totally change with this free app, by the way. It's just This is a real app. <laughs> At Columbia University made it. It's a great, it's cool. We do it with my kid. Uh, where was I? So nature has just become like this roadkill, just like, ugh, just this, on this road to human progress. But nature is our salvation. Nature holds the answer. Nature, we need to realize, nature doesn't create waste. Nature doesn't have pre-planned obsolescence. What we really need to understand is that nature is the ultimate technology. That's what we need to understand. And we need to sell it that way, and we need to look at it that way. A research technology that we can learn from. That's what geothermal is. It's nature's technology. Part of the things that you're going to be hearing about more and more is this magic word, resilience. This is the buzzword of the 21st century resilience, because we're not resilient. We're not prepared, right? This is, uh, this is uh, Nagasaki. This is 1945. This is after the bomb. This is, by the way, after the great flood, the tsunami, just in 2011. And I really have one question for you to consider. What the hell did they make that arch out of, really? That's impressive. Resilience is what we need to make our buildings. We need to add resilience into our buildings because images like this are not supposed to happen. This should not be New York City. This is what the most shocking part is, seeing the southern tip of New York just in a blackout. We're supposed to be better than this. We're supposed to be stronger than this. And geothermal systems are resilient. They're a solution to that. You've all seen this TV show, So You Think You Can Dance? I mean, I don't watch it, but you've, seen, you've heard of it, right? Did not blink or nod your heads or do something. Yes. Okay, good. Well, instead of so you think you can dance, maybe what we need is a show like, hey, you think you can build a, build a well or a geothermal pit? Like, maybe that's what we need. Shows like that that show people how to do it. Because we need to show people that this is a resilient technology. This is the ultimate technology. This is a better thing. Sticking our roots in the ground is a good, smart thing to do. All right. I have uh, two ideas I want to share with you, two energy plans. And um, I'm sharing them with you because I figured you'd appreciate them. The first one I call the Mupu plan. And uh, it really involves... Cows. As you know, cows, I mean, they're delicious and everything, but uh, cows, uh, uh, they poop a lot and they bark a lot. And so this is uh, Harris Ranch. If you dr ever drive between San Francisco and LA, you pass this. It's like right in the middle and it stinks. It's right next to the freeway. It's gross. You got to roll up your windows. It smells awful. It's just got all, it's like, this is what death smells like. And what you're smelling is methane, right? It's potentially valuable resource. It's just gross. It's just this awful, dark, icky, dirty place that cows sit and wait to die, really. And because of that, I call this place Cowschwitz. That's really what I call it when I drive by. It's a perfect name for it. And uh, it's just an awful, gross place. And what you're smelling is methane, and all of that's potential energy. And with simple technologies, we could actually siphon that off and create energy. And there's biogas potential all over, just like there's geothermal potential. And you couple these two together, and suddenly you've got a very interesting system going on. Plus, it's better for the cows. I mean, how happy do you think they'll be knowing that you don't want to eat them anymore, but you just want them for their you know, burps and farts? That's a pretty good deal. All right. The next plan really revolves around this idea that we're number one, right? This kind of notion that America is number one. And I looked up what we're number one at. It's really not the things you think. Like, we're number one in garbage production. We're number one in total energy consumption and use. We're number one in total per capita energy use. I mean, they're not good things to be number one in. We're number one in oil consumption, 21 billion barrels of oil a day. Tw uh, number one in oil imports. 70% of our oil is now imported. And number one in carbon emissions, 5.8 billion metric tons a year. It wouldn't, that's what we're number one in, if you want to be legitimate. And then there's one more thing that we're number one at. Obesity. We're number one. And so I thought, well, maybe this is, maybe this is something I can work with. So let's start looking at the numbers, right? You have a third of Americans are obese. That's a body mass index above a certain number. Another third are just overweight. That's another body mass index. And leaves the remaining third what I call uh, skinny nerds. We hate those people, right? Just skinny nerds, right? And it's about, all told, it's about 72 million Americans that have fallen in this overweight category, right? Including myself, for that matter. And, it's, and there's got, I mean, we're going to joke about it, but it's got serious risk to it. 300,000 people a year die. It's 117 million in healthcare costs. I mean, it's a big issue that we could fix. And this all gave me an idea. Because it, if you look at the projections, it's all by 2030, 86% of us are going to be over, overweight. So it gave me an idea I want to share with you. And it's a little unconventional. But I call this idea lipodiesel. I have a friend that calls it Aceline, but I don't think that's the right name. I think it's lipodiesel. 
And uh, so I just ran the numbers, just kind of back of the envelope kind of things. And I figured, okay, 72 million obese Americans. If we pay for liposuction for all of them, that's about $5,000 a piece, right? It's a lot of money, $360 billion. It's a lot of money, granted. But from each one, we could get at least 50 pounds of fat, at least 50 pounds, if not more, right, from each one. 50 pounds of fat, that's, five, that's half a billion gallons of potential fuel that we could get from each person. It's a lot of fuel. At 125,000 BTUs per gallon, that's 64 quadrillion BTUs of energy. And if you divide the first number by the last number, it's half a penny per BTU. It's the cheapest energy on the planet. Solve the energy crisis once and for all. And the best part is, they'll fatten up again. They'll just fatten up again. It's so it's renewable, <laughs> renewable energy. Think how happy all those fat people will be knowing that not only have you made them thinner, but they've saved 3.2 metric tons of CO2 every single day. Like that'll just, they'll be jumping for joy. It'll be cute. Uh, all told, it's about enough to power 800,000 homes for a year, every day. If you want to do uh, electric energy instead of heat energy, it's just a mathematical conversion. It's about 1.21 gigawatts of energy which just total coincidentally is what Doc Brown needed to power the DeLorean, which just total worked out that way. All right, that's stupid. Um, okay, so uh, I'm wrapping up now because I'm, I'm just going off the reservation here. Uh, what we need to do is we need to inject nature into every building we do. We need to make it be building like the way nature does, building like a tree. That's what's needed. We need literal living buildings, buildings that make their environment better, that heal the earth, and really are renewable in every form. And if you do this, not only do people like it better, but it's just, it's a happier environment, it's just a better place. Which leads me to my final type of Dota sapien, the activist Dota sapien, which is really you, it's all of you. I mean, whether you like it or not, you are all activists now. I'm knighting you, or whatever it is, right? Uh, and the way that works is that you're gonna plant a bold vision in your customers' heads. You're gonna show them a clean energy future of a more comfortable heating system, a more efficient heating system, a better heating system. And they're gonna want it and lust after it, they're gonna desire it because we need to build the way nature does. Because only mankind has global supply chains where we ship things all over. Nature sources everything locally. Only mankind produces CO2 as a waste product. Nature uses it as a building block. Only mankind just builds the same way everywhere. Nature adapts to its surroundings and its environment. And only mankind consumes and consumes and consumes and consumes to the point of excess. And to be fair, this was the fattest zebra I could find, to be fair. So we need to build the way nature does. I studied under students of Frank Lloyd Wright. That was my background and training. And this is a house that Ms. Wright has outside of Madison, Wisconsin. And it was built in 1948. And it's probably the greenest home ever built at the time. And it's a total passive solar house, right? The whole thing faces south, oriented to the sun. And Madison, as you know, gets pretty cold. The back wall is thermal mass. It's all masonry. And this is the front. This is the northern entrance. So you walk through that tunnel. And when you emerge in that tunnel, boom, you're at this just wonderfully southern exposure. And the whole thing is heated by the sun. It is geothermal in action. The sun comes through that, those big floor-to-ceiling windows, hits that back wall, warms it up all day, and then it, when it gets cold at night, it re-radiates out the heat. And then there's a second story that's held back a little, so the heat rises and warms the people upstairs. But yet our typical buildings are just, they're just plumped all over. They don't think about their placement. They don't think about their location. We need to build the way nature does, because nature is 3.8 billion years of research and development ahead of us. We need to build the way a tree does. Fix nitrogen, absorb carbon, produce oxygen. That's our goal. What do we do with trees? And eh, let's just cut it down and write on it, I guess. I don't know. Like, we're missing the point. We're missing the opportunity. If we open our eyes to nature, we can see whole new structural systems, whole new typologies, whole new methodologies of how to build. If we open our eyes to nature, we can find out how to build fragile materials in a strong way, the way the sponge does, the glass sponge. We can find ways how to build cement out of paper, the way the wasps do. We can learn how to build air conditioning without electricity, the way the termites do with their mounds. If we open our eyes to nature, we can look how to deploy rapidly renewable buildings, the way mushrooms do. All we really need to do is understand this idea. And we've been inspired by nature for decades. But now we're actually looking at nature as a biological system. And we're looking at buildings as being connected to part of that. We now have architects that are learning as much about biology as they are about design. Buildings that thicken up in the summertime and stay cool and thin out in the wintertime to let the light in. Buildings that look like they could just take flight. And buildings that look like organisms that you just crawl up inside and go to sleep. The potential is out there. It's unlimited. You have 2% of the market, and it's all open for you. And what do we build? Eh, it looks pretty good. We're missing the point. We're missing the opportunity. We can do a lot better. So your job is to plant a bold vision in their head of making every building a living building, making every building special. The way that I do that is I say that every building is going to have these five things. Every building is first going to grow a portion of its own food, and we're going to try to do that. Second, every building is going to generate a portion of its own energy, and geothermal is part of that equation. Third, we're going to clean our own water. Gray water, bioremediation, whatever you want. Fourth, 
we're going to process some of our own waste and then may potentially use it on site. And fifth, if you do the first four things, you're automatically going to do number five, which is sequester your own carbon. That's my goal. That's the reach goal for every building, every project that we do, and it should be for you as well. If you want to learn more how to do that and how your products fit into that equation, I urge you to go look at the Living Building Challenge. It's like lead on steroids. It's, it's a difficult thing, but you can download the checklist for free, by the way. Uh, I'm going to skip over this because I'm out of time. Uh, Sheikh Yamani famously said that the oil age didn't end because we, uh, the stone age didn't end because we ran out of stones. The oil age is not going to end because we run out of oil. It's just going to get more and more inconvenient. That's basically what's going to happen. And there's no magic solution that's going to come and whisk us away and save it. We really need to cut our emissions in half by 2030. And 2030 is coming. It's only about 9 million minutes away. It's coming and coming very quickly. It'll be here before we know it. That's why states like California are requiring net zero energy in all their buildings by 2020 for that very same reason. We have solar financing in place. We're doing the same thing now. We're experimenting with doing this with geothermal, doing financing in the same way. Power purchase agreements where we sell the power. Potentially, you could do the same thing. And you're going to see more and more of these financial incentives come alive. And they're going to be able to, they're not going to be tax rebates. They're going to be financial systems. And if we could do it for energy systems, we can do it for other things like toxic you know, materials as well. We need to realize that buildings create commodities. Your buildings create free heat and free cooling. And it's just a matter of selling that commodity and financing it the right way. We need to understand that if we're going to build like a tree, we, we're looking, we've got to not look at the trees just for the house for the birds, but all the other services the building provides. The last thing I want to leave you with is this. This is a quote from Arthur C. Clarke. In it, he said that any sufficiently advanced technology, if they were to come down for Earth like aliens or something, that they would be indistinguishable from magic. We would just think them magical. And the truth is, any sufficiently advanced technology would be indistinguishable from nature. That if we do our jobs correctly, the line between where mankind stops and nature begins would be invisible. You wouldn't be able to tell. That's how we know we've succeeded. Because nature is a wealth of resource and information for us. If we start to think and stop being dodo sapiens and stop being so silly, maybe we can actually change our ways. Maybe we can actually chart a course for what victory could be for the 21st century. That being said, you can contact me at all the usual places. Um, and Shelley, of course, knows how to reach me. And if you want to download this presentation, you can do it at dotosapiens.com. Otherwise, that's my time. Thank you all for listening. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you.